because I have Mattapanai, which is one of the sub-tribes of the Tsinnakamoka or the Powhatan natives. I have that ancestry in me. So I actually live only 30 minutes or less from the reservation, the Mattapanai and the Pomoki Reservation, in which we call today King William County. But back then it was just simply called Mattapanai and Pomoki, and where were Kamoka. That's what they were actually called. So what I'm going to do is do something very difficult. I'm going to attempt to paint a very complex, professional, large format oil painting. And I'm going to teach history at the same time. Now, sometimes people don't like to hear the real history. So what happens is, I don't know, I guess sometimes, I don't know, I get myself in trouble. But I actually have to say it from the point of view of the Mattapanai people. Not necessarily from the point of view of the history books, which actually, they distort the truth, especially Disney. They never actually told the truth. So, um, so basically, I'm getting my brushes and all my stuff set up to paint. And uh, all these designs I've basically done research on to get, uh, well, let me explain the painting. Okay, this particular painting right here is Opet Chanakano. We don't really even know who he is, but he is, I'm gonna explain that in a while. This is Wahan Sonoka, the person that they call Chief Powhatan, which is actually an insult. He was not a chief, he was actually a king. He was an emperor of multiple tribes, actually. He started out when he inherited the Tsinnakamoka with seven tribes, and he built that to a confederation of 31 tribes that went all the way from Delaware, USA, all the way down to the Carolinas, basically consuming all of Virginia, the state of Virginia, was basically his nation. They were called the Tsinnakamoka. So his name, his actual name was actually Wuhan Sinoka. Now he was a Wesa Warrix, that means king. Their name for king was Wera Warrix. So he was actually a Werewolf of the Powhite, Atens. There's different words. Powwow is, many people know if you go to a Native American powwow, pow means place, wow means gathering. Gathering place, powwow, place we gather. Well, Powhite in the Tsinnakamoka language was the Aragonian language. And those are the language of the natives all the way from Canada around the Great Lakes going all the way to Massachusetts, all along the coast. They were basically coastal people. They worked the waterways, the riverways, the bays, all the way down the coast of the Carolinas with their central location in the place that they called Jamestown. They renamed it Jamestown, which was originally called Waracamoca. And again, eventually it was called Elizabeth City before the state of Virginia was called the Virgin State or Virginia. It was named after Queen Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. So before it was called Elizabeth City, definitely a long time before it was called Virginia, it, the area was actually called Senecamoca. And there was a confederation of 31 major tribes. Inside of those major tribes, there were even more sub-tribes. It was basically clans. Just like the Irish would have different clans. They would have like the... Omahundro clan or the McCoy the McCoy clan or whatever. <laughs> exactly the same way here. So these clans made up a nation, which is kind of like our states or our city, major cities or states. And there was 37 nations within the Tsinnakamoka. So Powhite Aten is actually, if you go to Richmond, Virginia, that Powhite Aten was I can tell you the exact place of the capital where Wuhan Sonoka lived. He lived actually at the place we call Shimbaraza Park. Shimbaraza Park in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, I'm sure that most Americans, when we learn history, we learn that Captain, not Cap, Patrick Henry gave a speech in a certain church in Churchill, Virginia, called St. John's Church. Well, that church is located exactly where Wahan Sonoka's original 
major headquarters or home was where he ran his, where he was born. Now this is before he went down to the Tidewater area of Virginia. Now the Tidewater area would be now called Norfolk. And I can explain to you even why that area of Richmond was called Norfolk. Because there was another gentleman that I'm painting here. Uh, that is John Roth. And in England, before John Roth came to the United States, Guess where his local area was, where his family is from? Norfolk. <laughs> so that's why Norfolk is named Norfolk, Virginia, after him and where his family comes from. And the story is told that he actually married uh, Matoka because a lot of people think her name is Pocahontas, but that was a disname given to her. Then the person on the ground is John Smith, Captain John Smith. And then, of course, these are other various natives. And this is the fort of Jamestown here. And I'm, pay, I'm painting this based on a real scene in Virginia. However, the, the really, uh, if you take Latin or if you know Spanish or any one of the Latin language, you know that poco or poquito means little. So, and then also hantis in Greek means wanton woman or B-I-T-C-H or whore. So they actually was calling her in Latin and Greek, somebody educated John Roth by naming her Pocahontas because John Roth was a merchant, a major merchant. He was not the top aristocrat in London, but he was a wannabe. He wanted to aspire up to the nobility ranks. He wanted to aspire up to the aristocracy of, of, of England. So he studied Latin and Greek and he named her Pocahontas, but her native name in the Tsinikamoka language was our, Ga uh, our Galian, Ga uh, Ganguian language was actually Matoaka. And Matoaka, what people don't understand amongst the Native Americans, most Native Americans, especially the East Coast Native Americans, the royal bloodline did not go through the male, the man. It wasn't a patriot system, but we are a patriot. That means the father. It goes to the father. We are, they were a matriot system. So that's why Matoaka was important. So her name basically meant the womb of the future queens, not kings. And so why was Wohan Sonoka, uh, Chief Powhatan, so beholden to her? They said, well, that was his favorite daughter, but he, had, he could actually have many wives. So why was he so beholden to Matoaka? The reason he was so beholden to Matoaka, she was the daughter by which her and her mother, who was the Matoaka before her, had selected to be the royal bloodline for the future leadership. The bloodline that's been going on in that particular tribe sits forever, as far as they are concerned. But for perhaps tens of thousands of years, the bloodline has always traveled through the woman because uh, a woman could be with multiple men. So how did you know that that was the bloodline of the succeeding king and queen? The only way you know, you see the baby actually come out the womb. There was no DNA test then. So the maternal line amongst certain groups of people, even from Africa, some places is like that. Definitely for the ancient Egyptians, they were the same way. And so what happened was, Wahan Sanoka, his wife was the royal bloodline, not Chief Powhatan. He was basically the strongest, the smartest. So they had a tradition of the strongest, smartest male would petition the royal family to marry whoever the daughter was that was selected to be the bloodline of the future king and queen. They was never separated as a king having all the power and, a, and the actual queen having not that much power. Actually, the council of women, which would have been Matoaka's aunts and, and mother and great aunts and anybody in that particular bloodline, they were the council of women. The king or the Wessel Warwick's had to answer to them. They had to at least get their approval. That's how that government works. It's like we had a check and balance. We have, uh, we have Congress, and then we had the Senate, then we had the President. Well, Wahan Sanoka being the West of Warwick's, not chief, because that's an insult, because he was a king. So their word for commander, that's basically what it means, supreme, it means the commander of that particular tribe, or the person who actually called the last shot, the president the West of Warrens. So now the Matoaka, she was the one. So her mother's, what's one of her names? Her other name was uh, Atenuet. That's how you say it, Atenuet. That was her other name. 
That was her more common name. But her royal name was Matoka. Okay, so now she had another name that was given to her by John Roth that was Rebecca Roth. So she had several names. She had the name that was the put-down name. That's Pocahontas, so I don't know why we still even call her Pocahontas. She had the, the name that was given to her after she was captured and abducted and held prisoner like the Taliban does with women. <laughs> that was Rebecca Roth. And she had to convert to a different religion. And their religion was based on nature. So the area, if you go to Shimbaranza Park, you'll look over the area called the James River. You ever went to Richmond? There's an area called the James River. Did anybody ever ask you what the native name, what the James River was? Before any of the rivers. <laughs> Before it was called the James River, where it was called the Powhite River. Powhite means divine. Height means divine. So basically, Powhite Aten means the beautiful place of the sun that shines over the divine land. That's where, that was the name of Powhite's tribe. It was the most holy place. Now, it wasn't a place where they buried their dead. They could not put anything dead there. They couldn't kill any animals there because it was the way their god, which was called Mashe Manuto. That was the name. And basically that means the great spirit of everything. The great spirit of nature, of all existence. Even in the universe, even the cosmic universe, not just on earth. Mashe Manuto. It has to be the way Mashe Manuto. Man cannot manipulate that. So they couldn't kill an animal because Mashe Manuto put those animals there. They couldn't pluck a flower. And that's the Bon Air area of Richmond. So if you go look over Shimbaraza Park, over the James River in Richmond, there's a nice view. It's like a tall hill. So his village was actually called Powhai Acton Hill. Now, I don't know the name for hill in the Tsinemoka language. I used to know it, but I just can't remember it right now. But now it is called Church Hill. So what the English did, they changed the names of everything that was Tsinemoka, and they put... A Christian overtone, just like her name was Matoaka and her name was Amuakti. They changed her name to Rebecca. They also changed the name of Powhai Aten. Now, when, when John Smith basically being the leader, and John Roth being the financial backer, the interest of the London Company, the London Company was the company that sponsored and paid for the Powhatan invasion of the Tsinemoka Mokas. Now you could call it a colony, you can call it a settlement, but for, I'm speaking this from the my own Mattapanai tribe point of view. I'm not speaking this from the point of view of, and they're a nation within a nation, by the way. I'm not speaking this for whatever we're taught in school by the Department of Education. I don't want to do that because that's propagandized. None of that stuff is true. Some of it has an ounce of truth, but most of our history comes from the hand of John Roth. And then from the hand also in the journal of Captain John Smith, let's just put it in, in, in context, Captain John Smith was a hired mercenary. He basically would go in and kill, do whatever they, he had to do for money. He worked for the London Company, and they had already seen Cortez and what he did for the Aztec, what he did to the Aztec. They already seen then what happened to the Incas and the Mayans. They knew it was gold, perhaps, somewhere in the Americas. They didn't know where it was. It wasn't in Virginia, but they didn't know that at the time. So they were coming there to establish themselves to find the resources of the, of, of the land. Well, there was no gold there, but what they had was the natives had several cash crops that John Roth discovered. They had squash, they had corn, and they had tobacco. Those are the main three. And the women basically were the farmers. They were the planters. They were the ones that did all of the agrarian tasks in the village. They maintained everything in the village. They made the garments. They actually did the men's hair. <laughs> the men basically were hunters and fishermen, almost exclusively. Now, what they would do is they would have certain guys that things, certain jobs that related to hunting, like making arrowheads and making ax heads and making various tools. Now, men had those type of occupations. But the women were the ones who actually used fire to burn out a certain area and create the camps. And they would set these camps up or these settlements up before the men would come. And then as the men went to another hunting ground, so say every five years, the way that the Tsinikamokas behaved was they would migrate throughout their land in different areas so they don't deplete the animals, so they don't deplete the fish, so they don't deplete the soil. So they was very much in touch 
with how the soil and the nature they had tens of thousands of years to learn how not to destroy nature so they had a lot of respect for nature keeping things nice now you have to remember during their time you didn't have to pay for a big mortgage you didn't have to buy a big house you didn't have bills you weren't chained to your office you didn't have all these things we have over they basically made a living hunting and fishing so they had all the food they want basically for free they were farming so they was planting very clean nutritious food and most of these people lived to be 100 years old. For example, Wahan Sinoka lived to be 92 years old and being a warrior at that in a lot of battles. And Opek Chanakano, his brother, much younger brother, like 50 years younger, lived to be almost 100 years old. And he was a major warrior in a lot of battles. So these were very long-lived, healthy people. And even by the description of... Um, of uh, of John Smith himself. He said the average man was tall with a, a very athletically built body. These were not short guys. He was a very strong built people. And they spent a lot of time in the sun. So I would imagine they were somewhat, so had some kind of melanation to them because the average native did not wear a shirt in the state of Virginia, in this area. In the winter time, they probably had some type of buffalo now. We know the song that says, oh, give me a home. Where the buffalo roam? Well, guess what? That was Virginia. That was not somewhere up in Canada. That was not way out in Montana. They were all over this area. So there was antelope, buffalo, deer, all of this game all over the place in abundance. So they could wear very big buffalo wraps. <clears throat> Even in the state of Virginia, there was buffalo. Most of the trails we have, if you go out to the Shenandoah and the Appalachian mountain ranges of Virginia, most of the trails that we have now are ancient Buffalo and Native American trails. And the Native American just basically kept using, they used the Buffalo trails because the Buffalo would trample out them a nice little uh, roadway. And I think maybe the I Route 1 is basically an ancient Buffalo trail <laughs> for the most part, uh, for most of it, some of it. So anyway, but um, that's basically what that is, is an ancient Buffalo, at least going past D.C., up towards New York because the Manhattans was also kin to the Native Americans from here. They weren't the same tribe, but they were of the same language group. And basically, therefore, they was of a kindred. So that's basically describing these people. Now, Opak Chicano is rumored that a person named Don Luis. Now, if you don't believe me, you can Google this and research this for yourself. Or you can go to the library. You can go to the College of William and Mary. You can go to any academic archaeologists and anthropologists and find this out, there was a person called Don Lewis. Way before 1607, when Jamestown was established, he, is, he was already, now Don Luis, D-O-N, that's a title, that's not a name. His last name, Luis, L-I-U-S. Spanish name, he was a Moor from Spain. And he already had traveled to places like Mexico, and he was educated in Spain. But he was already here in the 1500s, and he had intermarried with the, either the grandfather or the father of Wahan Sinoka, or the mother. <laughs> I don't know how he fits into that group, but he was a person, that, and he had been there, and is speculated that Opek Chanakano might have been him, or his son, or his grandson, or somebody kin to him. Because he seemed to have a lot of knowledge of the fire sticks, what they call the fire sticks. I don't know the word for it that the natives had, but the guns, the muskets, the cannons. And he, they invented something called guerrilla warfare. It's the first place that is documented that guerrilla warfare take, took place, and that was with the Tsenekamoka Powerhide Atens. Now, the reason the colonials called them Powerhide Atens because they said, take us to your leader. Because as soon as what people don't realize, understand, they had a... The, the natives that was coming, the people that was coming to Powhatan had a battle with the Spanish ships coming from Bermuda on the way to Jamestown. Now, were they Spanish ships or were they Moorish Spanish ships? So when they got off into the coast, right into Jamestown for the very first time, as soon as they landed, it wasn't all this we come in peace. It wasn't like the Thanksgiving pictures that you see. They opened fire on the natives because it was hostile from the very beginning. And then over time, once they started uh, realizing they had start settling in a swampy area and they were getting stung by mosquitoes and 
picking up, that I'm talking the colonials, they were picking up certain diseases, they started to die off, they didn't plan their food rations, and it, the water was brackish water, and so they couldn't get fresh water, so they started to die. Half of the colonies started dying of lack of water, lack of starvation, and various other issues that was pertaining to mosquito bites. So what happened was, some of the, uh, Matoka was only less than 10 years old in, in 1607. She was less than that, because it's by John Smith's own record. He said, when he first met her, it was in 1608, late 1608, <clears throat> and he said that she was about, not 10 years old, about 10 years old. <clears throat> So we don't really know her age, but just to say if that's true, uh, you can kind of do some math and figure out when she was born. However, so that means if she was abducted by Captain, by uh, John Roth, but actually it's Captain Argyle, who convinced uh, a native that was not in Wahan Sunoka's Confederacy, he convinced uh, one of the natives who had married Matoka's half-sister, and she was jealous because she felt like the royal blood should go through her womb, but instead her family, Wahan Sanoka, chose Matoaka. So if Matoaka didn't exist all of a sudden, guess what? She would become extremely important. So her husband, who was already married to her, automatically would become the next supreme king of the Sinekomoka after Wahan Sanoka. So what happened was <clears throat> uh, the sister, half-sister, uh, over some pots and pans and tools because the natives really valued the, valued the metal tools because they had stone tools. They're tomahawks. The word tomahawks come from the Seneca Mocha language. Actually, the word canoe also comes from that. We, that. They didn't exist until Jamestown. That's how these words got introduced into the English language, canoe and tomahawk. But the tomahawks were made out of stone. Uh, the main way that they traveled was not by horse because there were no horses. The horses basically came with the Europeans. Horses had gone extinct like tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands years ago until the Europeans came and reintroduced them to the Western Hemisphere. So there were no horses. Their main way of traveling was by way of the waterways. So for example, the way they would navigate is, for example, my tribe is called the Maktapona. You would be at Ma. And that would be one fork in the, in the river going toward the mountains. And then you would get to Ta. So now you have Mount Mata, and then you get to Mata, and then you get to Po, the next fort. So now you have Mata Po. So if you live there, that's who you were. That's, that's what your tribe was called. And then if you actually was at the last fort, was Nai, you were Mata Po Nai. And of course, we don't know what the other fork is behind that, because that leads into the York River, which leads into the Chesapeake Bay. So the York River and the Chesapeake Bay is one of the, in the same as far as the, the Seneca Mochas were concerned. So anyway, uh, that's basically how things go. So she was 10 years old in 2000, I mean 1608. That means when she was abducted and she had her first child, which is Thomas Roth, that means that she was only five years older than 10. She was 15 years old. And let's put that in context, John Roth was already in his 50s. So <laughs> you have a situation where John Roth had lost his wife in Bermuda, just suddenly she was healthy one day, this is an English wife. And then suddenly she was not healthy and she was dead. Now they say that Matoaka, when she was in England, uh, she died from disease that you know comes from exposure to the European. However, I don't believe that most of the natives died that way because Matoaka had died in 1618. So she had 10 years of exposure. The same thing with Wah Wah Wahan Sinoka. He had 92 years of exposure. And Opak Chanakano had 100 years of exposure. Very much documented people. And no reports that they ever got sick of anything. <clears throat> so, how did the natives die? It wasn't necessarily diseases. What it was, maybe what the, you know, people say that, but if you have cannons and you have guns, and just think about it. The buffalo used to be here in abundance. And if you like to hunt, just like you kill off the buffalo, you use those same tools to kill off the actual original natives. But it's harder to say that, oh, wow, we genocided a whole flock of buffalo 
and a whole flock of people. So it's much more convenient to add in, oh yeah, there was diseases, and most of the people desired the diseases, and a couple of people, we had to kill them from time to time. But almost from the beginning, from 1607 all the way to 1649, there was continual war between the Ticinica Mocas and the colonizers. Now, the bottom line is that even though it was continual war, and even though they had what they call Matorca's peace after she was abducted, she was abducted because she was already, she had already become the Matorca. She had already become, had made a, a child. She had already been wed to a person they'll call Kokum. He was a native person. He was the son of a prominent, what's the warrants of the, uh, I forget what that, I think they were the, uh, I think they were, I forget exactly uh, that tribe he was from, but it was a prominent uh, tribe of her father. They liked this, this person, and just, just after she was abducted, he mysteriously was killed. He was just killed. And what the natives did was took her, the daughter, and hit her because it wasn't important that you had a son. It was important if you had a daughter because that daughter would come the next Matoka. So the next womb by which the, the royal bloodline flows. So that was already done. So Captain John Smith and John Roth found out about that. Now, they come from England where there's a paternal system. So they kind of was a little confused. So what John Roth felt like, what happens is, if I marry her instead, if we just kill the man off, because it's, the men are the ones fighting, the men are the ones negotiating, but they didn't realize what was happening really in the background was the women were calling a lot of the shots. And the men were just doing what <laughs> their wives was telling them, what the bloodline was telling them to do. The only one that was actually too young to actually be part of that group, because she was only 10 years old, was Matoka. She was an important part of that group, but she was just a little bit too young. And what happened was she would go and play with the younger people of Jamestown. She actually would play with them, but she did not deal with the older people because they, they seemed to be a little bit too aggressive, too dangerous. But the younger people, she would be on the outskirts, the trading place between the natives, where uh, some of the younger people in Jamestown were interfacing a little bit more in a friendlier way than what the adults were doing. And uh, of course, the young girls, if you, was not, if you was not puberty yet, you hadn't gone through that stage, the young girls didn't even wear an apron. So both the men and the women wore aprons only. No shirt, just an apron. Uh, however, if you were younger than that, boy or girl, was chances are, you didn't wear anything at all because it's hot. It gets hot in Virginia in the summertime. And that was their culture. They didn't think anything of it. So what happened was what a lot of people don't understand is that how did the men, if you was the son of a king, how did you get power? Well, you had to marry your niece or you had to marry uh, a descendant of your aunt or a descendant perhaps of your mom, like a half sister or something like that. Now, that's what you had to do. And that therefore a son of a king could actually, and that's what the practice was. If you was a very dominant man, there was a very good chance. And they only did that to have the child. And then they would have other wives. This is the reason why, because this is the wife that they had to keep the bloodline going according to their custom. But then this is other wives they had, but she was always regarded as the most important wife. But she would leave sometimes this wife and go and live in other villages with other wives or sometimes they would bring their wife with them. It all depends on how it worked. And what people don't understand, these women were allowed to have other husbands <laughs> of the bloodline, the women of the bloodline. And the common women, the regular women of the tribe, was not necessarily allowed to do that. I guess it was possible, but it was common for the actual women of the bloodline, once they produce the heir to the next female that had the bloodline, she was free to marry whoever she wanted to. Or she also still had a relationship with the Wessel Lawrence. She still had that relationship. So that was still honored. She was always honored. And her word was the usually the final word that men would basically apply to whatever these women said. So as a group, they had a lot of power within the tribe. And oftentimes you never even hear, you wouldn't even hear about her mother, Matoka's mother, because they would keep her very, very protected 
from any hostilities. And that's why it was so important for Wahan Sinoka not to allow his warriors to attack the fort. Because what John Ruff found out is if they put her up on a high place on the fort and put a knife to her throat, when they when Opa Chicano, he wanted to attack them from the very beginning. He never trusted the natives. So every time they would send warriors to basically rescue her or to eliminate the colony, they would simply hold a knife up to her throat and Wahan Sinoka, the father, would basically tell them, no, I don't think we want to do that. So they would back off. <laughs> and this happened for until Wahan Sinoka died in 1618. And when also uh, Pocahontas died just before that, 1617, 1618. Now, they would tell you she was 21 years old, but she, in fact, was about 18 when she died. So she lasted... Since the first contact with John Ruff, only 10 years. And since the contact with uh, the person she, she married, which is according to the English, uh, she lasted only for five years from basically, I don't know if she would, you know, if they, he got to as soon as she was abducted, but from 16, 13, 16, 14. So she only lived uh, four to five years with John Ruff before she was dead probably about, about four years. Now, in the meantime, she had at least one son with John Roth. That was Thomas Roth. I believe she had two sons. I think one was John Roth, who stayed in England with uh, John Roth's family there. And then the other son of John Roth, maybe he looked more Native American, I don't know. He came back and he met his uncle, Opet Chanakano, they say, but he wound up taking a position as a captain down in the Tidewater area, fighting his own people. So, and guess what? Those people were commanded by now the new uh, Paramount chief, which is Opec Chicano. So after 1618, Opec Chicano. This is the person you never find out. This is where the colony spent the more most time, not with this person they call Chief Powhatan, which is one side Tanoka. They only spent like. Um, 10 years with him, maybe 11. And then they didn't meet him immediately. They met him years down the road when Opec Chanakano had captured Captain John Smith. And what Captain John Smith did was he had a little boy from a friendlier tribe or a tribe that they, they would use the children. That's how they knew about, they used their young to attract the young of the natives. And that person became a guy and they was looking for he said, take me to your leader, you know, which is Wahan Tanoka. And the way that Native Americans, a lot of people don't know that. If you're Native American, you might know this. But the way you didn't have, like, uh, so for example, your name is Steve Foreman or whatever your name is, Tom Jones. That's the, according to the European way. You have a surname and then you have a, a common, a normal name, okay? Well, they had a nation name, so you would, you would introduce yourself to Seneca Mocha, Powell Height. Uh, Powhat Acton, and then whatever your subtribe was, and then finally you would say your actual name last. So that's how it was. So that's how they knew exactly where you came from, because most of the time Powhat Acton was a place. It was not uh, a the name of a person. It wasn't the name necessarily of a tribe. It was the name of a place. That's why the whole James River is named Powhat, and that whole area is named Powhat. So the the city of Richmond was originally called Powhat. <laughs> Jamestown was originally called Powhite, but most specifically, the holy place, because they had different geography, the Bond Air, Air area of Richmond was Powhite. You just couldn't kill anything there or do anything like that. So that basically is why they, and so they said, oh, you need to go to Powhite. And we know who you need. You need Powhite. So they were called all of the, the English is called all the names because John Smith had Powhite on, on the brain. Okay, yeah, I need to go see Powhite thinking that's a name. So he would say, Pao Hayton Wahan Tanoka. And then he said, oh yeah, okay, my name is John, my last name is Smith, so I need to see Pao Hayton. But actually, who he needed to see was Wahan Tanoka. That was his actual name. Of course, he had other titles too, which is uh, Mata Notwick. Basically, Mata Notwick mean, meant uh, supreme leader. It's kind of mean emperor, king of kings. Mata Notwick. So uh, 
He wasn't a Wesley Lawrence. So Wesley Lawrence was the governor or the commander of a tribe. But what, what Han Sanoka was, he was the Wesley Lawrence of the Powhatans, which is his tribe that was on both sides of the James River, by the way. But the main part of it was right there at Shimbaraza. And then another cousin tribe where some of his family come from, they were called the Arahatex. They are also located right there beside, on the Richmond side, or the northern side of the James River. And so then if you go down towards Mechanicsville going north, you run into another tribe called the Chickahominy tribe. And those, that tribe was independent of Powell Height, and they were a dominant tribe too. But they also, toward the end, they found out, well, a lot of natives are getting killed, including us, and they can't tell the difference between us and you. So they actually wound up joining him, but they weren't officially part of uh, the Powhatan, or the actual, not even the Powhatan Confederacy. They were not part of the Tsenica Mocha. So all the way up to the Rappahannock, they were actually part of the Tsenica Mocha. So, uh, and a lot of the words that we have as waterways now, like the Potomac, the Appomattox, those were all tribes that existed that are now extinct. The only tribe that kept its continuity since the beginning all, is only two that is the Manapanai, that's my tribe, and the Pomonki tribe. And then, of course, they have state recognition because they were able to keep their, their reservation got smaller and smaller and smaller. Actually, they had the whole state. Then they had two sections of the state, one in the north and one in the south, with the colonials living in the middle. And then finally, those two areas got smaller. The one in the south disappeared, and they only kept the section going up the York River at the Manapanai and Pomonki River. They only kept those sections. Everything else got sold to whatever... Englishmen would move here and could afford to eventually purchase some land. And oftentimes, if you were an English aristocracy, you were given land. You were just given their land. And, of course, the natives did not understand ownership of land because they would pick up every so many years and just move to somewhere else. Everybody in their nation owned all of their nation's territory. So there was no sense of ownership. They all were share, even the food. They just didn't understand the concept of you can pay a personal property tax or you can own this and no trespassing. All that stuff was introduced. So oftentimes they were accused of and they got killed because they were accused of attacking a colonial that had a settlement or a farm or a plantation that he was starting. But in reality, they were just hunting. They had weapons, bow and arrows. That's what they that's how they got their food. So they okay, he has a weapon, he's on our property. Therefore, we must kill them. So they would pull out their long rifles and pow, that was it. And of course, they, the, the Tassinica Mochas would go to the colonials and they would make a petition. Nothing happened. So in comes the importance of Opec Chanakano because constantly they were getting killed. Nothing would happen. And then finally the natives said, you know, we kind of like the way Wahan Tanoka did things through diplomacy. They did things through intermarriage. And I think that was part of John Roth's that was part of John Ross' mentality is that if I marry her, because they have a tradition of marrying people to ensue some type of peace, or maybe he wanted to be a king of the new world. He wanted to be aristocracy over here. And I think that's why they pushed Matoka as uh, Rebecca Roth, because what they were trying to do is establish her as a queen. Therefore, if he's married to her, because you have this thing called the first families of... <laughs> the New World or the first families of Virginia. And of course, John Ross' family is one of them. So uh, these people were basically lower in people in England. They might have been peasants or serfs, what they were called. But they came over here and got some land and start farming. And of course, tobacco is an addictive product. And it became very popular in Europe. So John Ross was the main, the first drug dealer in the history of the world. <laughs> it's John Ross. He was selling tobacco, just like they sell marijuana, a plant that grows in the Americas that everybody loves, and it's very addictive. And he was selling that, and he made a lot of money, basically sending that tobacco crop to Europe, and the rest is history. Cigars, pipes, cigarettes. That's all John Romp. So the first colonials, he was basically figuring out how to stop growing tobacco the way the natives grew, because they would grow and mounds with some, some tobacco here, some corn here, some squash here, and various beans and other things they had. And of course, what John Rolfe was doing was using the English system where you would clear a whole field and plant nothing but one crop. Well, what happened with that system was the natives were very interested in not depleting the soil. 
And there was, they didn't need a lot of different fertilizers and things like that. They understood by growing these crops together, one crop complemented the other crop. But over, you know, like I say, about five or 10 years, even before the soil got depleted that much, they had just enough experience to know, okay, before we destroy all the soil altogether, we're gonna move to another area. So they were able to maintain a very large ecosystem that was natural and friendly for a very long time where there was abundance of food and there was no, there was, the, 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 the word uh, jibola, that means forked tongue snake. There was no lies. You couldn't be a, you couldn't say one thing and deceive and mean something else. That was a very bad thing. <laughs> so, uh, and that's what happened now uh, when, when uh, Matoaka and um, her uh, spiritual leader, because that's how I know she wasn't a Christian, because her spiritual leader went with her, as well as many handmaidens, to England. And what Hansenoka told him, say, look, they said, told us that Captain John Smith had died. He killed, he hurt himself and died. But I think he's still living in, in England. Find out because the colonials lie much. They lie much. That's what he, that's according to the Kassalos and the, uh, the Manapanai, and also as well documented in England as well as statements, and even by John Paul and John Smith themselves. And of course, what happened was the whole story about Matoka saving John Smith was something that was added later, because what people don't understand is while Matoka was living, she was not famous. She was not necessarily famous amongst the natives. She was not famous in England. She became famous because John Roth wanted to propagandize her to make her great so that uh, she, he could have a claim by blood, just like the English royalty and the English kings and queens and the European kings and queens had a, a claim to territory. He wanted to claim to the Virginians through her. So Captain John Smith and uh, John Roth was very much trying to build them up amongst the English because they got the English royalty to believe it. Their system would be imposed on the new colony and perhaps even imposed on the system that the Tacita Kamokas had. And then they thought that somehow they would gain because they found out, even according to John Smith, when he first met Wahantanoka when he was captured, of course, what he did was he took the guy, the little boy, the native boy guy he had, when finally Opechancano got him, he covered himself and he tied the boy to him so that the arrows of the natives would hit the boy and not him. And so what the natives did was they, they held their arrows. They didn't fire because this boy was the son of a Wessel Watts. He was reported. So these little uh, pretty tough little boys was going to grow up to be the future leaders, they were kind of curious. They were kind of going around and they became the guy. And so the natives knew who he was. They didn't fire on him. And so what happened was the natives did kill some of the other Englishmen. That was with John Smith. They didn't kill him. So when um, they, uh, what basically old Chuck Chicano was taking them to other reservoirs of other tribes and say, hey, this is what the, the new people look like. This is, we captured one. We captured an important one. That was Captain John Smith. And then finally, Wahansinoka wanted to see him. So they took him up to Richmond. Now, if you ever go down to Interstate 95, where 64 and 95 interchanges, that's basically where the house of Wahansinoka's parents lived. <laughs> that's where his, his family lived. Now, once he became a, a, a king, especially once he became the Paramount King, the, the better part, Notwick, uh, he basically became... He moved up to the Shimbaraza, which is basically down the, if you go up Main Street in Richmond and up the little hill with a little, and go to the Shimbaraza Park area, that's basically where he moved his headquarters away from where his father was living. Of course, his father was just the Wessel Warks. Uh, his father was not necessarily the supreme king. So because Wahan Sinoka was such a superior warrior, and he was the pick of the, uh, the mother and the father, the grandmother and father of Matoaka, and so he was able to marry into the bloodline and therefore become the supreme king of kings, uh, the better Notwick. Okay, so the better Notwick, I should say. The, I'm sorry, Meta Notwick. It's the proper way to pronounce that. So, this what this particular painting is about is 
when Opec China Kano finally convinced Wahan Tanoka, we have to do something. She's it's 1613. She's abducted. We have to go get her back because her husband, her first husband, where, where she has the future king with, well, which actually Kokun was the future king. He's dead. But there is a daughter that exists. So it was important for him to, to get her because she's important with her daughter. And they had the daughter. <laughs> the natives still had the daughter, but they didn't have her. So we must go get her because now uh, the aunts and aunts, they were still living. Her uh, aunts and aunts and sisters were still living. But she just was a little smarter, a little brighter, had a little bit more get up and go. And they still want her her bloodline. They felt like her daughter was a was from a, a good man, which is Kakum and her. And so he wanted to marry into that. Opak Chicano wanted to marry her. Now, Wahan Tanoka knew his bloodline was in her, so it was very important for him to secure her as well. So what happened was when with the knowledge that Captain John Smith and John Roth had, they knew that if they threatened her life, that both these uh, senior members of the Tassinan Kamokas, the Supreme Leader and the next prince, which is his brother, they were brothers, perhaps half-brothers, perhaps full brothers, but the only person that was in line to be the king through marriage was Kakum, and he was killed. So, and then there was another gentleman who was killed as well. So the only person that was left was Opek Chanakano. Now, uh, that's the story that Disney won't, won't tell. There was no love in this relationship. She couldn't, you think about it, if you come from uh, Brazil or you come from any country where you don't, have never heard English before, and you start speaking English, how good is your English going to be after only she first had contact with John Smith in 1608. So in only five years, she's mastered English enough to negotiate whether or not she's going to marry John Roth or not? I don't think so. What they had was the, there was a linguist who had befriended the, uh, a certain tribe that was not necessarily in, pop, in Wahan Tanoka's confederation. And he was living amongst them. He had... Uh, befriended some people that spoke a similar language, I think in the Carolinas and Georgia somewhere, just going up. There's, the language is all the way down to Louisiana. Uh, so he had explored and he was a linguist anyway, and he had familiarity with languages that was akin to the uh, Algonquian language of the Tassina Kamoka. So he was, he could actually translate for Captain John Smith. That's how they got a lot of the names and that's how they were able to negotiate. The persons doing the talking was not her. The person doing the talking was this linguist translator, Captain John Smith and Captain John Roth. So anything that said that Matoka said, she couldn't, she didn't write one word. She couldn't write English. She barely probably could speak English other than just the basic words that a person that's been, that migrates to this country and never heard English before. Similar type of uh, mastery of the language is probably what she had. At best, at the time of her abduction, so... How can you teach her the whole full complex uh, Christian belief system with that little bit of mastery of the language? It's very difficult, very difficult to teach that. So, and the linguist was very busy living amongst the natives. He only had one or, one or two. Captain John Smith wasn't a linguist. He depended heavily on these people for information. He was constantly going in contact with them and he was using boys as guides. So anyway, this boy was taking him to find, because he wanted he didn't want to find Wahan Tanoka to talk to him. He wanted to find Wahan Tanoka to perhaps study him in order to kill and you know subdue uh, Wahan Tanoka. But what happened was Opek Takano ambushed him. <laughs> they were these were guerrilla stealth fighters. They used the forest. It was a dense forest here in Virginia. And so uh, Captain John Smith had arrows all in him. Even using the boy as a shield, and even that he had the breastplate on, he had his helmet on, he had the full military regalia on. Uh, luckily, because he had his full colonial military, military armor on, none of the arrows pierced anything that actually could make a mortal wound. And then, being that 
The rest of him was a human shield with the little boy. He survived that. And what happened was uh, they were somewhat, Captain John Smith started to kind of seduce Wahan Sanoka and Opek Chanakano. He started to show them little shiny things that he had on his person. And the natives had never seen metal before. So just imagine you have never seen a shiny metal with this. You've never seen some of the tools that Captain John Smith had and some of the technologies that they had. It was just quite interesting. And John Smith used that to kind of entertain because what happened with the Native Americans, the, the Seneca Mochas, is that they spent their whole day from sun up. The men went out to hunt. They usually went out before dark to hunt. They came back home in the evening after a hard day of hunting, usually bringing back game, fish, or whatever. The women spent their whole time working very hard. This is by the account of John Smith and others, uh, basically working, as, working the farm and doing all of this stuff back in the village. And then at the end of the day, they would always have a party. They would always meet on the outside of their longhouses. And what they would do is dance, play music, and sing and tell stories. Now, there was one time where it's basically, according to their culture, it's taboo to tell stories. That's in the summer, because in the summer, you had to be busy planting, you had to be busy doing everything and preparing for the winter. Uh, so therefore, during the summer, there was no story timing, because you had to be prepared, you had to be working hard while everything is good, because they did have some seasonal uh, planting times. So it became taboo to tell certain stories but the storytelling and the dancing and the music was something that these cultures did. So what happened was Captain John Smith found himself, <clears throat> and I got some people kind of waving at me. He found himself in one of these ceremonies <clears throat> after being captured. Hello, uh, David and Richard. How's it going? How's it going, Mocha Brown? What's up, cousin? I'm talking about us. Okay, so he found, um, he found out that it was... Um, you know, that they did this, and he, he didn't understand the dancing. And what happened with the Native Americans, uh, the feather is, 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 is a symbol from the nature, from Opat Chanakana, from God. Because the eagle especially flew the highest in the sky. But the birds flew closest to the heavens, is where they believed that their God came from. For some reason, all humans believe that God came from the sky. But so if a feather fell near you, or if a bird landed near you, or especially if it landed on you, that particular, each bird had a different meaning. Of course, the eagle means certain things. And of course, you pick up that feather, you will make a headdress out of it. Or if you felt that feather had something to do with your weapon, of course, with the hunting, it was very important. You would add that to your spear. You might add that to your tomahawk, or you might add that to your knife, or whatever tools that you had that you worked with. So that was kind of how they felt they was getting a spiritual message. So um, I'm saying that to say uh, uh, they would actually have their weapons with their, if you were a person who your main tool was a tomahawk, you had your, your best feathers on that. So they, these were not actual tools that they would use every day. These were their ceremonial tools because these feathers came from heaven. So they wouldn't use this necessarily unless they were in a major war where they thought they was going to die. Then they might have used that weapon <laughs> as a weapon. But for the most part, if you saw the weapons that had feathers on it, a lot of them, or just any kind of feathers, uh, or if they had feathers in their head, that means that this, this particular warrior, if he was a warrior, he's prepared to die, perhaps. Uh, if he died, he just died. If he didn't have feathers, well, he's just out there hunting, or he's just out there doing his work, you know? But if you had a weapon, so uh, Captain John Smith saw these people with these feather weapons, these weapons with these feathers on it, and they were ceremonial weapons. They were doing their dance with them. You know, it's kind of like your rank. If you're in the military, and you got all these stripes on your arms and these badges and all this stuff, and you come out with your hat on, that's a general. You know, that's a lieutenant. That's a captain. That's a sergeant. That's whatever. You knew your rank, so... When they were doing these ceremonies or doing these kind of like festive dances, they had their, he had his tomahawk. And Captain John Smith mistook that as he might have been trying to kill him. He's a bunch of savages, is what his, word, his words were. And that he might have killed him with this. But basically, 
It was just part of the costume for dancing. That's basically what it is. So he didn't understand the culture. And so when he wrote in his journal, he added in that she put her body over him. But what she was was a, a person of importance. So I'm sure she came out and did a dance because she's the king's daughter and everybody was celebrating and they had a good time. I don't think there was ever a chance that they was going to actually kill Jonathan John Smith at this point because he had given them metal weapons and perhaps some jewelry and some things like that. And one of the things that they did was the kings would wear pearls from the Chesapeake Bay, literally pearls and beads made out of shells, you know, alabaster, I don't know what you call it. But various beads. So if you was royal, especially if you was a queen, and uh, but a king also, you might have many, many large beads that go all the way down to your knees. <laughs> um, and that was a symbol of your rank, uh, that you was royal, that you was somebody very important. If you didn't have pearls or beads made out of the shells uh, from, the, from the bay and from the ocean, from that area, you were probably more or less a common native. <clears throat> so... If somebody gave you something that's shiny, like a pearl, and uh, something like that, and he gave it to a king, that was a sign that you were trying to make peace. So Captain John Smith was learning. So that actually is what saved Captain John Smith's life, and the natives loved the gifts that was given to them by John Smith and returned them to, safely to Jamestown. They just gave him back. They said, hey, we got swords now. You know, we got whatever Captain John Smith had on him. You know, he might have had a long spear or something. Uh, and he probably had a musket <laughs> or whatever on him. And he definitely had the helmet and all that stuff, I'm sure. Some boots and stuff, some new gadgets. And he might have had some little jewelry and some decos. He gave that to the, these men as gifts. Every time he met somebody intimidate that he was scared of. Because Captain John Smith was four foot eleven. Just let's just get this. That's his statue. Uh, native people and my cousins would tell you they're Mattapanai blood in them too. Most of our people six foot six. You know, I'm short for my family. I'm barely six, seven foot, seven foot tall even. <laughs> but a lot of cats in my family like six two, six three, six four, six six. I got some cousins almost seven foot tall. That's that. Uh, to Seneca Mocha DNA in them. Now they may get it from other elements in the family. Other people were married in as well. But my grandpa, who was Mattapana, he was a tall person. He was at least six foot two, six foot three. So um, that was basically, uh, you could see that how Captain John Smith would have been very much afraid of these tall, towering people who spent their whole day from the day they time they get up to the time they go to bed. Even the dancers was very active. So you're talking about some people that was very much in shape, you know? He probably didn't have a lot of fat on him, had a lot of muscle. And like I say, the woods is dense, so you don't have fat guys running through the woods. Because at that time, the forest was very dense, so these guys spent most of their time on their foot or in their canoe. And basically, they would make these canoes all along the place and just leave them. And then what they couldn't navigate by canoe, they would do by foot. But you could travel quite a long distance. Those canoes travel very fast. And so the natives could get from point to point much quicker than Captain John Smith could on foot. And then if he did get some horses, how do he navigate through this dense forest? No roads had been established, and he did not know the Indian, the buffalo trails like the natives did. <clears throat> so he needed a guide. And of course, he's going through there with all this armor, clunk a clunk a clunk, making all this noise. The natives are going through there sounding exactly like the forest, not making hardly any distinguishable noise at all. It was very easy for them to get ambushed and so even though the English had superior weapons, what the natives had was stealth. They were extremely good with that. So most of the time, by the time you was able to get yourself prepared to defend yourself, they were already in your personal space with the tomahawk. That was the number one tool of death. <laughs> it was tomahawk to the head, man. Most of the time it was going to be to the face because you had a helmet on, or to the neck area, or something like that. I have... Uh, uh, Opak Chancano with a spear, a long spear, a long spear. I have a poof here of, of a certain animal, another one here, and of course a spear. I haven't painted that in. He's already hurt Captain John Smith, and the only place he could really hurt him at is in the legs. That was the only place that was really exposed because he was basically close to what we call a musketeer. 
And they were used to protecting, you know, the main organs, right, in the chest from any kind of spear or bow and arrow or perhaps uh, some type of sword. And of course, whatever they needed to take care of, they would just blast them with the pistol. They had a couple of pistols on them. And that's kind of how they had those short battles. And then after those two blasts of the pistol, it was all sword action. But if you couldn't get your sword out of the sheath, you was in trouble. Where the natives, the tomahawk never got put away. <laughs> tomahawk was always at the ready. So, and then their knives was already always attached to their hip. So they always had their weapons very close to them. And if your primary weapon was a spear, your primary weapon was a, and I can have Wahan Sanoka with a traditional tomahawk with the, um, with a very hard stone attached in a traditional way because he's older. But by the time Opak Chanakato was a similar age to Matoaka, younger than Wahan Sanoka, I have him with a metal tomahawk that he traded with the English. And also on the end of his spear, perhaps a piece of metal that's reappropriated as a spearhead because he's a mighty warrior. And he needs to be able to penetrate the armor and the defenses, the body defenses of the English. Now I have some of the other natives with the traditional weapons, some mixed weapons and some bow and arrows and some with traditional weapons. And of course I have the colonials with their long guns and of course, what happens when your shot comes out? Your gun turns into a club because you've already shot your shot. Of course, I have them with their long uh, spear kind of things with the hooks on them where they could pull another knight off of a horse. But they also could use that in battle and stay some distance away. So you have a colonial at the ready here. You have a colonial that's fallen. And then you have a native person shot their shot. But then you have a native with the tomahawk. He's right on him doing a backwards tomahawk move. Of course, they, this is from the time they actually breached. This was the last time that the Senecamocas had a chance to completely vanquish, like they did the, the colony of Rono. They had a chance to completely vanquish the, the Senecamoca land of the, the invading English. I I'm going to call them invading English. Uh, people like to call them settlers because... After all, look, we created the United States, but there was no such a place called the United States until after, well into the 1700s, almost the 1800s. I mean, we didn't organize our government, even though in 1776, we basically uh, won against Cornwallis in Yorktown. A lot of history happened right here. This is Yorktown. <laughs> or Warakamoka. It's another word for Jamestown, Yorktown area. That's what this is. Of course, that's the ancient word. Uh, I think it's Gloucester County now. Gloucester County uh, is what they call it. And then, of course, you go up from there, you have my county called King William. One section, that's the Mattapunai, is only like 30 minutes, 15 minutes down the road from where my parents live. And where all my cousins got fam uh, uh, land and where our family land is. I mean, we all can just go there, even if you don't own any land. <laughs> We do the, the Native American way. We share. We kind of, we don't say hey, no trespassing is mine now. You can still go on the land and do whatever you want. So um, basically the bottom line is um, uh, you had, uh, there was a, one of the ways you also got rid of the Native Americans, the Sinecomocas, was when you got, after the Civil War was over, you had plenty of Native people, but by this time they had mixed because the, the African slave did not want to run away all the way to New York or Massachusetts somewhere, five, 600 miles away, through all these other English settlements where they can be pressed back into slavery. And of course, the slave catchers was going to probably catch them or somebody was gonna send them back. However, if you just ran just 10 miles down the road to a Native American reservation, that was the easiest way because they were a nation within a nation. They had their own laws. And their laws was that you can marry into them. <clears throat> if you married into them, you were no longer an African slave. Of course, the African slave, what would they call them? Native Americans, Negro, colored? <laughs> you know, they didn't really have a name. You know? So they became officially the Tsenekamoka. They became officially identified with that tribe. Matapanai, Pumonki, Chikahomini, whatever. Now, a lot of people think, well, the English, you know, there's white people that intermix with them. Yes, it was. Because when the English first got here, they had, the Scottish people were not necessarily the most friendly 
at the time with the British. And a lot of these people was looking for a new time in the new world. And one way to get here was to work your way here as a mercenary. And they found that the, that the, 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 the Seneca Mocha had some nobility to them. They had some sense of uh, decency about them. And so many Scottish colonizers left Jamestown. These were European Scots. I mean, real 100% Scottish people. And that's where my Anderson family, they were from Northumberland, England, I found out. They joined. And there was other Scotsmen from that region. And that's the region that's just right on the border between England and Scotland. They actually uh, left England because looking for opportunity. And basically what they did was they found that you know, there was not that many English women here at the time. <laughs> you know, it was a frontier. It was hostile. Oftentimes you were going to die. That is not a good prospect for a good city English woman who was used to jewelry and fine clothes and walking around with her really nice big dresses on and, uh, and wonderful plays and <laughs> all these interesting things. They'd much rather go to France or someplace like that. <laughs> They were not really interested in coming over here to, to, to live in the mud. <laughs> so a lot of these English peasants, as well as the English aristocracy that came here, um, basically looking for fortune, they found their wives amongst the natives. Now, what also happens is when I talk about John Lewis, he might have been African by way of the Moors, by way of Spain. So it's a person who spoke Spanish, but if you was to look at him, he would look like a, a West African. Um, but by the time you get to Opak Chanakano, he was probably the son or the grandson of John Lewis. So how many people did John Lewis bring with him when he, so the English weren't the first ones in Virginia. I'm just one, I know they said the first people in the North American continent was the English. It's not necessarily true. Actually, it was the Moors of Spain. <laughs> they were already doing this probably before they, uh, people don't understand Pedro Alonjo Nino. Please Google this if you don't understand. Actually was the person who led Christopher Columbus' ship. There's a painting of him. So you can Google and see his picture and see exactly what he looked like because he was a wealthy man. He led the ships. And they didn't discover America. They discovered Jamaica. Captain, I mean, uh, uh, Christopher Columbus never set foot on the area that we call the United States of America today. He set foot on Jamaica. He went to some places in Central America and South America later. But what he did was he left a bunch of people called the Maroons in Jamaica. These were Pedro Alonio Nino Africans. So if you go to Jamaica and ask a person, are you a Maroon? Basically what, uh, what he did was once he thought he was in India, trading with the Indians, he said, oh man, I found a new passage. This is way quicker. I need to go back to, to Europe and tell all my buddies about this. And so he... Uh, the, 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 the Moors um, basically woke up the next day and all their ships were sunk in the harbor. And the Spanish were on their ships with, with, uh, with uh, Christopher Columbus, with some natives on board to be slaves, by the way, and um, headed back to Spain. And basically left a small group of, of, of uh, I guess, European Spaniards to kind of maintain the fort, so to speak, and subdue the natives that was there and to deal with whatever Moors that was, well, was still around. And so the Moors stayed around and they live in the interior of Jamaica today. You can ask anybody in Jamaica that there's, there's people called uh, the Maroons there. And that basically, the whole word Maroon basically means we left stranded. <laughs> so these people were already trading with the native natives from West Africa and also from Southern Spain. That's no wonder that the person who actually was the original person that discovered using the septon. The septon is not necessarily a European invention. It was used by the people of Northern Africa, who at the time before the Moors was expelled from Europe, these tools were also in Europe, but these tools also in Africa. And the African had not, never been mulatto sized or mixed as they are now, we call them Arabic type people, but they don't even speak the same language. DNA wise, they're different from the people from what we call the Middle East now, which is really West Asia, but that's a whole different topic because <laughs> it's east of Europe, that's in its middle way to Africa, 
but it's not east of it's not the east it's not middle it's basically western asia uh so uh anyway uh, they're different from northern africa they're different and so you have a mix of people that came in slowly over a period of time created a slightly different culture just like for example the people of west africa let's say nigeria look and culturally are different from the people they just, that, that the U.S. American, African American descends upon, we look different now. Look at me. I have West Indian ancestry, <laughs> I mean West African ancestry in me, but also have the Seneca Mocha ancestry. So as you start separating and as groups migrate, people kind of change a little bit, both culturally, but they might have started as an original group. So we have to understand that East Coast natives was a very... Uh, was already perhaps mixed people. Uh, the Seminoles, for example, <clears throat> basically I think Seminoles means runaways. People who are runaway slaves coming from the Caribbean and coming from Louisiana, who was here first, and different areas like that. And multiple tribes that had to band together to become a Seminole. A Seminole, I don't think, is an original Native American word. That's Florida. And we all know that uh, Donald Trump, he loves Andrew Jackson because Andrew Jackson was the one that drove, that, that destroyed the Seminoles in Florida and basically made Florida a state of the United States. <laughs> but basically what he did was he ran at whatever remaining natives out of Florida who had befriended some Hispanic or some Spanish people who had befriended some African people. They were already friendly mixing and intermixing and have been trading they got trapped there in florida after the colonial powers took over these people got trapped and of course they was ran out of florida all the way across uh, louisiana and texas all the way to mexico <laughs> and that's where they ended up uh and what we have left is what we call the seminoles but the nucleus of them the most powerful of those people were actually just pushed out all the way to mexico and they and the Americans left them alone once they were in Mexico. <laughs> but let's go back to the Tsinica Mocha, basically the Mid-Atlantic natives uh, of this region. Uh, this, these tendencies were happening. You have a group of people called the Gullah people of the Carolinas, of those little islands and those little uh, peninsulas. Those people are almost 100% African. And they have dialects and languages that come from West Africa all the way down to Angola. So, yes, they intermix with the natives, but they actually kept a little bit more African uh, as, as they got isolated. And it wasn't even until after the Civil War that people even discovered some of these Gullah Islands had never basically been into slavery because they were isolated and they were mostly African. So that's why the Gullah culture survived kind of intact for so long because it wasn't destroyed due to the slavery policies. Likewise, it was policies that destroyed the Tsinica Mocha ultimately because whatever Tsinica Mochas had married, uh, European had lightened up some. Whatever Tsinica Mochas that married uh, escaped uh, slaves or uh, people of African origin somehow had blended into their group and they were brown. In the early 1900s, right around the time of the First and Second War, somewhere around there, it was a gentleman, I forget his name, he had about 30 years on a board that's in charge of the censuses, in charge of control of the peoples. And he took censuses, and what he did was he did a, what you call a paper genocide. There were plenty of Tsinica Mocha natives left, but they were mostly of mixed ancestry. Some of them were pure. I believe my grandfather was pure. Um, maybe he wasn't, but definitely his, his father and his father's father was, So and his father's mother was. But anyway, so it definitely was around the, the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, Still 100% pure to Senamokas. So what happened was anybody was a certain complexion was classified as white. And anybody of a certain darker complexion, they were originally still to Senamokas. They were really still Powhatans, is what they call them. Uh, but they were classified as colored, quote unquote, or Negro. And if there was something that was ambiguous and they really, I don't know, he's not quite black or she not quite black, they called them mulatto, even though there wasn't one white parent and one black parent. They listed them as mulatto. And that was a minority of people that was listed that way. The majority of people was listed. And then you had a person, if you had affiliation with a reservation, you would still call Native American. 
So if you only live like 10 miles or 5 miles from the reservation, you can actually go down to your local courthouse, local courthouse, not the national or the state, and say, I'm Tacita Kamoka Native American, or I'm not a Panay, I'm not a monkey, or whatever. But you couldn't go to the federal government and say that because they didn't recognize it. So what happened was the state had changed this. Of course, by virtue of the state changing it, you didn't have any records at the federal government. So a lot of people who were Native American by heritage, but also somewhat mixed, racially ambiguous, somewhat mixed, but for the most part, culturally, were to Seneca Mocha. Uh, and the language was destroyed because they passed a law, I think, around in the late 1600s that if you spoke the Tosinicomoka language, you could be hanged, you could be dragged into court. <laughs> of course, the penalty for that was death for speaking the language or some severe punishment. Or if you were caught without a, a Christian name. So you took on the name of a friendly neighbor, somebody that you respected, or you married into somebody and you took that name. <clears throat> so if you had a name, so a lot of times the middle names of the Native American, or just the name you had when you was at home, was a Native name, usually a middle name. And sometimes a first name, uh, but you also had like a quote unquote Christian name. So for example, you might have had a name like Henry Anderson, but then your brother might have had a name like Farney. And then his, your, your other brother might have a name like Creed, Creed, Creed. Then another one might have a name like Tonka, you know? So, so you have, or Tuox, you know? So you had all these different little names, and then after a period of time, the language is starting to go away. So, you know, just grandma always said that Tonks is, Tanka always been in it. I think it means, you know, little, little pie height. That's what Tanka, tanka means, little pie height. So, but... Nobody, a lot of people didn't know what the name meant. They just know somebody, great grandma called this one that, and this one looked like that one, so that's what we're going to call him. So, you know, this is the nickname, or that's the actual name. <laughs> and so that, those certain ones would get certain names, and certain ones wouldn't. It really depended on how they wanted to name you, because this was very informal. So that's how the names disappeared, and they got English names. Also, another way that they did the paper genocide was, of course, if you classified as Negro, you could be pressed into slavery. So a lot of the original natives, if they was too brown, if they was caught fishing somewhere, looking kind of like a Negro, sort of, but they're Native American, doing what they've done all along, what their grandparents have done, they just happen to be looking a slightly too much like the slave down the road, a person that just came from England could actually seize that person Take him down to the court and say, hey, this person don't have any papers. He's not on the reservation. That's where the first definition renegade. A renegade is any Native American that was not on the reservation. Or the, and they had different, Native Americans wore armbands. I have him with a whole entire sleeve armbands, but they wore armbands. And basically, they had to wear a special armband to let the colonials know which tribe they were. So you found them in the English area trading or doing something like that, they had to know if you was friendly, not friendly, or who you were, who, who was your reservoirs, who was your, at that time, they weren't even called reservoirs, they was demoted to chief, who is your chief, and uh, they, they, oh, I don't, that's who he is, he might have a normal English outfit on, but he might have a certain feather, a certain something armband on, and so they were identified, if you was not, if you could not go to a certain uh, reservation and that chief said I know who he is I know his mother his grandmother or cousin or whoever you could be pressed into slavery <clears throat> and then oftentimes you were in an isolated area you didn't even get to leave that county so you were slightly outside of your county you never even got a chance to go to the next county to ask your relative you know to make a petition to say look I'm not an escaped slave I'm actually a descent of Kamoka so uh, it was very easy to press people into slavery. And of course, you started to mix with very heavily with African people at that point because you're not even connected with your own people anymore. You're on, a, on an actual plant, not a reservation, but a plantation. So these are the things that happened in Virginia. But in the late early 1900s, uh, this new act was passed. This new person that was an administrator 
basically reclassified all the Native Americans as either white or black. And so after about two or three generations, we come up until about the 1960s, 1970s, the children didn't even know what they were. So people was thinking, I'm white. I have a white name. The black people say, well, I have a white name, but all black people have a white name from Europe. <laughs> so that's who they are. They didn't even know that they were also to Seneca Mocha. Now, in comes a DNA test. <laughs> of course, we take DNA tests now. So how can you tell if your DNA, if the Tsena Mocha may be mixed with African already, how can you tell that this one, so you go to somebody you say is 100% Native American, and you get their test, and then, of course, you go get your test, and you see how much you have in common, and you have like 40% uh, 40 40 in common with that person. Uh, <clears throat> that's a very, very, um, that's a very, very, um, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> or you have 30% or 28%. Or 15%. Chances are, if you have that large a percentage of DNA in common with a Virginia native, you are you were at the Seneca Mocha. You have uh, a connection with the original people, and you were a victim of the paper genocide. So, what happened to the Native Americans going from Delaware all the way to the Carolinas? They became either today we call black, or we call them white. And that's the sad thing that has happened in this country. And I think this is what's the problem that we have in this country today. That system needs to go away. <clears throat> I think it's okay if people honor their heritage because, you know, I have friends that when I was in, living in Pennsylvania says, I'm Irish. And my fact, our family is going to, my dad's going to get us a whole lot of us and the cousins together. We're going to Ireland. We're going to see some distant cousins. I had another friend who was Italian. Yeah, we're going to go back to uh, uh, Palermo or whatever, you know, and we're going to see some cousins. And, uh, you know, I mean, this stuff happened around World War II. Sometime people came over. However, if you're to Seneca Kamoka and it's sad, and you're the original people in this area, you can't, and the, the Seneca Kamoka was interfacing with the, the natives from Pennsylvania. You cannot go and say, okay, I'm going to go back to my native area. This is right here down the road from where I am and pay respects to my heritage. I can't learn about them properly. I can't because, first of all, they're not taught in school properly. Therefore, I'm painting this picture. I'm painting this picture with a story that goes with it that tells the story from the Manapana native point of view and the Pamunkey native point of view and the Nassaman native point of view and from the Chickahominy native point of view in the very surviving tribes, even if those tribes don't have state recognition, they are still surviving tribes, point of view. And many of these tribes, because the natives did not have a written language, yes, they had totems with symbols, but they didn't have the script. So they couldn't write anything down. So the way they passed these stories down was through family sacred archives, basically orally. And then, of course, of course the Pamunkey and the natives they learn English by the time you get to about 1640s, 1635, 1640s, some of the children had learned English to the point where they could actually start writing down the family information. And since they were marrying prominent uh, Englishmen and women, these people were, had a very strong command of the language and a lot of the Manapunai information started getting preserved around the late 1600s. Now, the problem is you have about a 60 year gap between the time that the original Captain John Smith and John Roth interfaced with Wahan Sanoka, which is a person called Chief Powhatan, and Opak Chanakano. So, Wesley Warren's uh, Wahan Sanoka and Wesley Warren's Opak Chanakano. That information is as per John Roth and Captain John Smith, mostly. Uh, but we do know that these gentlemen, they live to be 92 years old, him dying in 1618. This one dying in 1649 at about 99 to 100 years old, somewhere in that category. So they're very healthy, very long-lived people. Now, Matoaka died at about 18 years old. She didn't live that long. 
And she only had five years from the time she was in custody, four years, I should say. And, and two of those, <laughs> in two of those years, she was having babies, by the way. It takes nine months to have a baby. So she had two babies in four years. So she was mostly weaning the babies. And so uh, the story is they were going down, what, the Thames, Tom Thames River on the way back to the New World. And as they passed a certain church, suddenly Matoaka got sick and died. And they say of the, the Native American disease. However, she'd been 10 years with them. She'd already been in England for a long time, for a little piece of, a little spell of time. Never got sick. But suddenly she got, and when she got on the ship, she was fine. But then all of a sudden, as they were traveling, as what happened to John Ross' first wife, all of a sudden she gets sick and died. Now, it's even speculated amongst the English that she could have been poisoned. Nobody knows. It's a, myst it's a mystery. <laughs> but I say that this guy, he was ruthless. He was about establishing himself. He didn't need her anymore because Wahan Tanoka, he had gotten word that he had died. So her significance as a human shield, as a hostage human shield, was no longer important. She was no longer shield. Even if she came back, the only person that was going to honor her and not attack them was alive, was, was, was Wahan Tanoka. And since Wahan Tanoka was not there, she was not important. Therefore, she could die. Now, Opak Chanakano, he's the boss now. He is the, uh, he is the, the, the metal uh, Nakdowik. He is the king of kings. He is not, he's gone from a Wessawarks to a metal Nakawik. So he is the head man of the entire to Senate Kamoka. So what happened is he knew he had to deal with Opek Chanakano. And he knew that Opek Chanakano could care less because he knew that there was already another, her daughter already existed. And there was already other women that he had already married who was a candidate for the royal blood. So it didn't have to just be one. The king would select one person, but if she was to die or something happened, it would go off to her sister, either older or younger. Generally, it started with the older sister, and it went down, but really it was the most capable, the smartest sister. And that's how it went. And oftentimes, you know, in the period of people living, the older one is more experienced, so obviously the older one usually gets the nod from the parents, and... That's the case. Now, the people who basically made the deal with Captain Argyle to convince her to get close enough to the English, she was afraid of the English because she had to get her half-sister and her brother-in-law to convince her to go close to Captain Argyle's ship, where Captain Argyle had all these treasures out because the natives just love uh, the English inkets and trinkets and stuff. And of course, the sister and her half-sister and her brother-in-law was promised if you can get her to come and get on out and come close to us so we can seize her um you're going to get this treasure and so what happened was uh they convinced her to come close there's a there's a picture that was done by a colonial person of this that exists you can google it see the actual thing going down as they depicted themselves so this is not just me talking and um, there you are negotiating with Captain Argyle. And what happens is they even, the painting or the picture even shows different stages of the, the original abduction. And basically when she got close, Captain Argyle sees Matoaka, dragged on the ship, and then to calm her down, what they did was the natives, one way that you can appease a native was give them some pearls or some beads or something like this or in the case of the English, some shiny metallic things. But so they gave her some of these things on the ship. But another way that you could show your friendliness or you could calm the natives down to show that you meant well was you give them a feast. It had to be your best stuff. And the best, the better it was, the more you were showing how important she was. So Captain Argyle immediately had a feast. Because I think that's the way Thanksgiving got started, because these guys was figuring out the traditions of the natives. Because again, in the evenings, they would have a big feast. Everybody who was important was invited, or especially in that village. And if you weren't important, you was invited, but people that had prominent positions was always the royal people. So the big feast was very important. If you could provide that, you were an important man. 
And of course, if you were an English providing that, you were showing that you were an important person and that you meant well. So they gave her a feast on the ship. I don't know how that was received by her. Nobody says that because all the information you get is from Captain Argyle and the people that was on the ship and then the Captain John Smith and of course John Roth. And of course, well, for half for a small amount of time, maybe a year or so, but Dorcas just disappeared after her abduction. And they were said that she was somewhere near Appomattox or somewhere near Petersburg or Chesterfield. And they don't even know who was keeping her. But she had to disappear out of sight so that Opat John O'Connell couldn't find her and Wahan Tanoka. But when she reappeared, she was in Jamestown with Captain John, with John Roth and Captain John Smith. And this is when this attack happens right here. And the whole idea is they're going to get back their Matoaka. But at the last minute, instead of it being Pocahontas saving Captain John Smith or Captain John Roth's life, the reality is her life was held for ransom for time. So that they can get reinforcements, they can get more troops over there because the first people that came over were not women. They had African slaves in the first Jamestown ship. 1619... The British had captured some African slaves from a Spanish ship. I don't know, 200 people was on that ship, African people or more. That was basically made into slaves instantly. But before that, even in the original Jamestown, there was African people there to do the labor. So there was already, from the very beginning, a multinational, even with the English war, was a multinational, multi-ethnic group started to come together. And then also before the English brought people, there was already people of African heritage <clears throat> interchanging and dealing and trading themselves with the natives. And this was on the islands of the Caribbeans. This was also going up the East Coast, especially the East Coast of the United States. <clears throat> and if you was to look at some of the original pictures of Opat Chanacano, a Wahan Sunoka, you'll see people with a different texture of hair. It's not that straight, necessarily a straight texture of hair. Sticky straight up, shorter. You know, to get a mohawk, your hair has to be to go up and defy gravity to some level. You know? Um, and you can see their hairstyles were kind of uh, shaven. They weren't that long one. And also, sometimes it was long, but it was going... It was doing some interesting things with different textures, even. So I believe if you look at, and this is the English uh, making these, and it's okay if one artist kind of, it's a little wonky, it makes a weird one, but one artist after the next artist after the next artist, every time they did a rendition of a, and this is not just a regular person, this is an important person of a Native American, they always had a certain kind of look that doesn't look like we consider to be an Italian guy with a wig on or somebody like that <laughs> with a wig on, you know? It was somebody who looked a little bit more like if you was to go to Brazil today and go deep in the Amazon, and you see somebody that looks a little bit more Mongolian or Asian looking, and then they might have some African-esque kind of features. <laughs> they probably, that's what the original Tsinamokas looked like. And then these people were mixing with African people, so you had some people that had to look like that. you know. And again, they spent most of their time with no shirts on, just an apron, so there was no... There was no sunblock then. There was no tanning creams. So you just can't spend 24, you know, the entire day of the summer out in the sun without being already a very somewhat heavily melanated individual. Uh, that would be something that would be necessary, I believe. Unless you were, uh, now some of the natives, as you get toward Canada, they were actually a little bit different. Their, their features, so you had basically, what a lot of the natives uh, feel through their folklore, there was about four different ethnic groups of natives already in this country. What a lot of archeologists have also discovered is there's the way they make arrows, the way they make their tools, you had at least four to five different techniques. Of course, some of the natives like the Aztec or the Olmecs before the Aztecs, and the Mayans had uh, metal origin. They were working with gold, they were working with silver, they were working with various metals, they were working with copper. Some of the natives were basically in the Stone Age, they were just working with stones. So you can see that there's different ethnic groups with different technologies, even before the European came. And what happened was these groups had already started to interblend. 
They had tens of thousands of years to transfer technologies and information and culture and of course DNA amongst themselves and make different groups, subgroups. You can follow lingual patterns in the ethnology of words and languages and you can find at least four different major groups just like you have Latin in Europe and then you have the Scandinavian languages then you would have the Aryan languages or the Germanic languages or the Teutonic languages, etc. You have the same thing going on in the Americas, just like you have certain, like Swahili has certain elements of all the different Eastern African languages, but they all are different. You had something like that going on. <clears throat> However, then you have certain cultures that the languages has nothing, of, none of that in it. So same thing was happening here. So, uh, and that's what was going on just before the English showed up. So, this is when we were trying to, or the United States was trying to, and of course, you see I have the, uh, the British flag there. So, uh, they were not the Americans. What happened was when everybody got rich, when all these planters became lords themselves, or by their own word, lord means master, uh, what happened was they wanted their independence. They was tired of the English aristocracy. They had their own aristocracy going on. And the common person had an opportunity to move up. <laughs> so nobody really wanted to be affiliated with the old system in Europe anymore, even though, according to the English colonies, they wanted to name everything, like the James River after King James, and uh, King William after King William. Uh, you know, uh, various counties were named after different people, uh, Charlottesville, Elizabeth City, all these uh, areas was named after influential people in England because the, the merchants that started, because it was mercantilism that was getting lumber because they had already depleted all of the lumber out of England. They were getting furs, pelts were very important. They had already depleted the wildlife out of England and out of Europe. So all of these products was coming out of Virginia in addition to tobacco, in addition to corn because there was no corn. <laughs> in addition to certain things like squash, these items was coming out of Virginia, there was money involved, and it wasn't gold, but if these, were, these proved to be very, very prosperous industries, as well as fishes. Now, I don't know how they preserved it, but a lot of this stuff was getting over to England and ultimately to the rest of Europe, and a lot of people was making a ton of money through mercantilism. So the original people, all the way up until about 1630s, late 1635, were mercenaries. They were not a lot of women. They were not peaceful people settling. They were not this wonderful colony thing where we have a family. Okay, that's why you have to go up to Pennsylvania, to Plymouth Rock for that. Because you did have some people much later coming over in a whole different area, and their beginning was kind of different. But I'm talking about the initial Jamestown colony, that the one that inspired those people to come, that did not start that way. This started by just hardened soldier, uh, cold blood could kill up mercenaries, coming over here, hired by the London company to subdue the native, found out the native was tougher than they thought, had to negotiate with the native, then ultimately through setting up systems, uh, was able to ultimately conquer the native. So this, with this, this is gonna be a series of paintings that I'm making about the Cinemoca. Basically, these are based on uh, other images that was made current to the time, also based on research, and also based on some of my imagining of how things might have gone down. So since nobody actually made a painting of the abduction, of not the abduction, but when Opek Chanakano and Wahan Sanoka went to rescue his daughter and perhaps his wife-to-be, uh, and almost won, basically defeated the Jamestown colony, but they retreated. They backed off for absolutely no reason. And the only reason they backed off was because to spare Matoka's life. So that's why she was important. Her life, literally, that in Captain John Smith, he flipped it. Her life literally saved the entire colony. And for that, I think Captain John Smith owed her something because it must have been tragic for her. 
be abducted by people from a foreign country that she couldn't speak with. Let's go, for example, let's put it, let's switch it around. Say if the Taliban came here, we didn't speak their language at all. And basically, they abducted, say, me. <laughs> and say I'm a female. And um, they decided, you know, we're going to make a baby with this person because his dad's a very important person. And now I find myself all by myself with these people. I don't speak any of their language. And now this person is pressing himself for sex with me. <laughs> That's a horrible situation. That's a Taliban terrorist type of scenario. She must have been terrified. She had no way to communicate with them. And I'm sure that maybe a translator here and there would eventually come down and some bits of information was communicated to make her feel like she would be safe and everything would be okay. But even when you hear John Smith and John Roth quoting conversations that she supposedly had with her father when she actually did re-meet him when he went to attack, basically... She said that she preferred to stay with her by their words. It's not by his words. They're putting words in his mouth. But she preferred to stay with her captors. Because you didn't come get me when you had a chance to get me. You preferred to get the weapons, the pieces of metal, and the ingots and trinkets. Now, that wasn't her father who did that. That was another world of warrants and her sister that did that. Now, her father could have risked everything to come save her because she was probably used to her him doing that with other native people but the native people had similar weapons to them his father probably was superior to them but in the case of the the jamestown colony they had far superior weapons and opec chanakano and wahan tanoka knew this and it was very hard they had one opportunity to rescue her and at that time that's when he backed off now he could have gone ahead and attacked but i'm pretty sure the Englishman would have gone ahead and cut her throat. Because <clears throat> that's what they call it. They call them cutthroats. Actually, the Sioux tribe, they were called cutthroats. Because they were hostile. They were just called Sioux hostile. That's basically, Sioux means hostile. <laughs> so, I mean, that's one of the original meanings for that, that tribe. After they got contact, of course, with the, uh, with the, the new uh, Europeans that was here. So, anyway, that's what this painting is about. This painting is about that particular attack. That has not been told. Now, this is a controversial painting. A lot of people could say, oh, I hate this. this is a, I don't like this. This is a negative, whatever. However, in order to deal with reality, you have to sometimes, my grandmother used to say, tell the truth and shame the devil. If you sugarcoat everything, things stay dormantly rotten for a long time. You have to actually deal with it, package it, and preserve it. And just say, I understand what it is. There it is. It's preserved. Now we know that's that. Now we know not to do those things anymore. Or now we have learned something. However, when you want to just sweep the thing, the dirt under the rug, the dirt's still there. You didn't deal with it. You didn't take it away. You didn't do anything with it and organize it somewhere. What you did was just, there's a pile of dirt and trash building up. <clears throat> so that's what we kind of have here by not actually addressing the full history, but telling a different version like what Disney did. First of all, I mean, you wouldn't go to a Holocaust situation and take a person who was abducted by a Nazi for five years and produce children and say, okay, this is us getting together and fixing everything, all the jacked up stuff that was done. <laughs> you're not gonna do that, then you're not gonna be Disney and tell us that kind of story about it. No, you're gonna tell the truth, because that's what happened. So why shouldn't I, not as a movie maker, but as, a, as an artist, also tell this correct story about my own people? <clears throat> it's important. It's important at least for the Tsenekamoka people who still survive. It's important for the Matapanai people who are part, it's my people that's part of the Tsenekamoka. But it's also important for future people who migrate over here to know the truth about things because those things can get lost over time. And it's important for even the people who might have been on the side of John Roth and John Smith who come from that way of thinking. Nothing is wrong with it because that was the future. They had advanced civilization that they introduced to the native. And of course, the native was all over time blended in. Perhaps that's better. Perhaps that's not better. Perhaps they could have done it differently and borrowed the better aspects of both groups. 
instead of going that very nasty negative way. However, America did the success of the New World better than any place to call, that's called United States of America. It was more successful than any other place, basically because of the cheap acquisition of new lands. Secondly, because of the fact you had free labor. Anybody that runs a business know if you have free labor and you can get resources for free, you have a very great business uh, product right there. You have a very great business model. You know, a nucleus to work from that's very powerful. So that's why we did better than countries in South America. That's why we did better than countries in Central America because they were not, they didn't do, they did this stuff, but they didn't do it to the level that these guys did it to. <clears throat> and they didn't do it as ruthlessly. And then over time, they kind of, this tendency to marry in that I was talking about happen much quicker in some of these places. So now you're kind of like, you're going to enslave your, your, your cousins and your, your family members. You know? And then it started to be kind of like, uh, okay, well, this is the Dominican side of the, the island and this is the Haitian side of the island. You know, you start getting that kind of thing happening. Where they originally started out as the same people, but they start interfacing and blending. And because of the way people look, oftentimes a lot of decisions both good and evil is made because of that. And I think that's what's happening right now in this country. And if you look at it, not too much is different between most human beings and even their cultures. They all tend to believe in some type of religious system. They all want to have families and raise them happily and do things like that. But at the same time, you cannot squash one person's culture to promote another one. So this painting is one of the few paintings that might exist if not the only painting that exists, <laughs> that actually depicts the many battles, because there was many battles, or not just the battles, but the activities and event, events that happened during that period. It's like we just blacked that period out. It's like Jamestown happened, and then, okay, now we're going to dips Yankee Doodle, you know? <laughs> you know? Now we're defeating the British. The, the Redcoats are coming, you know? And to me, that's kind of wrong. It's kind of... Um, Okay, I think I'm back now. I uh, apologize for that. My battery went down completely on my lavalier mic. And I'm trying these lavaliers, but these batteries keep running out. But I was working with a weak battery thinking I had a whole session that I could do. And as it turns out, I couldn't. So I don't know how long my battery has been out. But I've been sitting here, blah, 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 talking. So I spent enough time talking. So whatever time it was, my battery went out. I don't know, but maybe I should have some kind of inner ear listening so I can know when these things happen. However, I'm going to paint now because I don't want to... Uh, I would do some history as I paint. Let's talk about that. So I don't spend too much time blah, blah, blah. And I don't want to get too... I don't want to be offensive either. I'm not, that's not my goal. I know a lot of people think, oh man, this is so divisive and things like that. But... That's not my goal. My goal is, I'm a, I've always been kind of like an underdog person, but when especially it comes to my own culture, I think it's very important for me to support that. And also to speak to people who don't have a platform, people who don't have, whose um, opinions and viewpoints are often overlooked. So, uh, and so basically this painting is speaking to those things uh those those stories because these are true stories is if you go to any native american studies major university that offers those type of uh that type of education you're going to find that the stories that i'm telling you is very much the truth now the depending on who the teacher is is how they put the slant on it if the teach a lot of teachers favor you know they're very patriotic it's america it's america so they're going to tell you the point of view of the colonials. And then a lot of people, just they love the natives. They just want to tell the real true story. They're true historians. And so what they do, there is some interpretation involved. But 
What I am basically telling is the Mattapanai sacred stories of what happened as per the natives that still survive today. I am not telling the story of what the history book people say because I know that's a, a total lie most of the time. And like I say, most of the information they have, they don't even go back to the Mattapanai, Pamunkey, the Chickahominy, and the various tribes to survive. To ask, you know, I mean, you would think that you're talking about them as a, as what happened to them, and they are the descendants of them. But you don't, you just use the, the, the you use the genocider and the enslaver and the invader, the mercenaries point of view, John Ross and Captain John Smith. These were ruthless, nasty people. I mean, that's just not fair to only tell history because it's documented in English. So it's very easy. You're not much of a scholar because all you have to do is read what they say. <laughs> And, of course, we know that that's one side of the story. That's one point of view. And often they was trying to start a new country. So just like um, today you make propaganda, you can see the Internet. One, you know, the people that support Trump, they can't see the people, the point of view of the people who support, say, Joe Biden or Hillary Clinton or any other issues. Everybody got their own perspective and you can see the same exact thing happen, but if you're inclined to think a certain way, well, you're gonna tell the story according to that point of view. And that's the problem with our history in the United States. We only have the point of view of one side of the storyteller, one side of it. You never have the view of the Tsenica Mocha. You never have, and that's why we don't even know their name. Because nobody's going to bother saying, oh, actually, they were called the Seneca Mocha. Because you're going to call them, the, the English just said, they didn't want to say, they couldn't say to Seneca Mocha. And of course, they had to say a whole bunch of other stuff like to Seneca Mocha, Pau, Pau Hai Aten, uh, 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 <laughs> it's hard for me to say it, uh, Mata Nata Wick, uh, you know, it, it was just too much. <laughs> so, you just said, Chief Power Tan. <laughs> it's much easier to say that. So, you know, so that's what they called them. And then, unfortunately, he got short down to just Power Tan, you know. And really, it was the village he's from called Pau Height Octon. And it was near the place called Pau Height. And, of course, the glorious river that ran through Pau Height was the Pau Height River. I don't know what the word for for river, but it was called a power height. Now, we still have the name of the Chesapeake Bay. By the way, the original Chesapeake lived on the North Carolina side of the Chesapeake Bay. And some of them actually lived on the, I think that's uh, New Jersey or whatever that peninsula that comes down. But they traveled, they, they traveled that waterway all the time. They had big long boats that was capable of navigating the bay very easily. So um, uh, you will find the Chesapeake. Then now the Chesapeake as a tribe uh, still exists. A little small portion of them. I don't know. I know that the the the, uh, the Nanzamans are very near them, but they're toward the west of the Chesapeake. They're not quite the oceanfront people. They might be extinct. I don't know. But like I said, you have a few families that survive. You know so. You kind of mold through. I mean, you had something like uh, 100,000 people in the state of Virginia during the time that Captain John Smith showed up. And then you whittle those people down to about less than eight, about 8,000 by the time you get to the early, to by the time uh, Thomas Jefferson got here and his contemporaries who basically had them numbered around 8,000. I think Thomas Jefferson had them as a little bit less. And one of his uh, other people he had in charge of numbering them had about a little bit more <laughs> at the same time. So nobody actually knew how many they were because they basically lived kind of away from the English because it was dangerous. And if you still had, you were culturally behaving like a, the Seneca Mocha, like a native, it was dangerous. 
So, and that was the only way they knew. That was the only way they knew how to live. So, uh, slowly, as some, they were coming out the woods, you know, <laughs> literally. Slowly, if they, as they came out of the woods, they would become Englisherized, you know. And, uh, and if they survived, they would become <laughs> Englisherized. If they were still too native, they could get shot on the spot, you know, because they simply just didn't know the laws. They didn't know the rules. And basically, the natives got scared. I mean, the, uh, the, the colonials got scared. They had their little cabins and their little uh, farms and plantations that they were building. And what happened was, uh, shoot first, ask questions later, you know. <laughs> kind of mentality started to take over. So uh, that's what happened because in, in uh, 1649, when he died, he was the only one that the natives could go to that could actually talk to the colonials and kind of negotiate, but at the same time, he negotiated from a position of military power, whereas Wahan Tanoka negotiated actually through diplomacy more. But I think he did that mostly because he had to, because of his daughter, Matoaka. Uh, but from the very beginning, I think he was, when he was taken by Opat Chanakano, when Captain John Smith took Opat Chanakano, gifts were given, so for a few years, those gifts basically gave the colonials a whole lot of tolerance. <laughs> and so, and in a sense, Captain John Smith was very smart with that. So with that said, I'm going to actually start Ernest to paint now because, um, and I hope I, I'm not trying to necessarily be offensive with, with the story. I just want to basically tell the truth. And I do want the truth to be received because... Oftentimes it is not, and uh, if you had a chance to, to, to talk to Native people from the Manapanai tribe or other tribes, it is a, a, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of sensitivity. But the great thing about it is there's plenty of scholars out there who do have that sensitivity, who do know through their archaeological work and through their history, historical work um, and respect the actual true stories. But the problem that I have is that, uh, and I remember the local high school near where um, I live. I went to the um, I went to the um, the history teacher in terms of how they were teaching about Pocahontas, and I said, "Why don't you teach that her actual name was Matoaka, and that this is actually another version of the story?" And he said, "Basically, the federal government approves our curriculum." And if we teach anything different than what's in the approved curriculum, uh, we could lose our jobs. <laughs> and I'd say, as a person who is of Mattapanai descent, I said, well, you know, I have a family member who's of Mattapanai descent, and she has to go learn about her ancestors, and basically she has to hear the word savages. She has to hear the fact that they were jacked up, killed, abducted, and they were abducted with, with the father not even trying to rescue his daughter. He didn't have any nobility to him at all, any integrity. He just basically sat there and let them just get her uh, <laughs> without even a negotiation. I mean, that's not even discussed in the history books. It's just, and but, but, but Matoaka, is told that what she did was after getting abducted or before she just loved Captain John Smith so much. And uh, then when you find out when they say, well, what if John Smith is already like 48 years old uh, during the time he met her at 10, good gracious, I mean, how could that be a love relationship? So here you have a little girl, say, in middle school or she might be in elementary school or something like that or even in high school. And she's a little girl herself, and all this stuff in the news. And then you learn, and of course, you're teaching um, your relatives one story. And then they go to school and find out that, well, this is kind of in conflict a little bit. And uh, if she was 10 years old, when the world is 55-year-old and 49-year-old, 48-year-old men, Doing with a 10-year-old girl, an 11-year-old girl, and a 15-year-old girl. I mean, why is that happening that way? <laughs> you know? And then if they identify with that person, 
I, I don't know. That's not very positive. That's not leaving a very good uh, image in a little young person's mind. And that's a big disadvantage for somebody who is not of um, European origin. It's a bad disadvantage because what happens is all of the heroes is Captain John Smith. All your heroes is John Roth. And then the person that you want to be a hero dies in a very pitiful young age of mysterious things that nobody knows exactly what happened. And of course, her father, we don't know. Her mother, we don't know. And nobody even wants to know. <laughs> that's the whole, that's another part of the problem is that it's not so much that we don't know, but nobody wants to know. Well, who was her mother? Well, of course, if you have um, a tradition where some people say, well, not only was her mother Real name, well, her name, real name was Matoka, but she had a, um, a daughter, I mean, and the daughter actually survived in um, the area of Gloucester County and to marry with a certain family. And uh, so the descendants of Pocahontas, in a way, still exist. But how important was she? But how about the descendants of Opechanacano? Where are they at? What's their family names now? Is it possible that they are some of the uh, first families of, they're literally the first families of Virginia? But where are they? Where's their lineage? Why isn't their lineage important? Why is only the lineage of the people who interface with the colonies, colonizers, important? But the, if, if Wahan Sanoka was important, that they call Chief Powhatan, why isn't also Wohan Tanoka's brother is important, and Wohan Tanoka's cousin is important, and Wohan Tanoka's other daughters are important, and sons. What happened to them, and why aren't they important? <laughs> you know, because after all, once, once uh, Pocahontas dies, or once Matoka dies, they become the heirs. I mean, a dead person can't inherit anything. It passes on to the person who is alive. So who is that person? And how come that person doesn't get pointed out? But only the colonizer side gets pointed out as somebody who inherits anything that happens later after that. And so those questions never get addressed. It's just, okay, that's going to be pushed aside, and we're going to move on. Now we're going to talk about... You know, Yankee Doodle Dandy, you know, when George Washington <laughs> chopped down a cherry tree, which he probably never did. <laughs> you know? So um, these stories need to be told for everybody, and they need to be told the right way. And I think there's no way but the correct way. <laughs>